Shalom. Welcome to Light of the Nations. Previously, we learned in Maimonides, in the first chapter, in Halakha 18, a general principle that the menorah and its vessels, the table and its vessels, and the incense altar and its accompanying vessels, and all of these sacred vessels that are used for the divine service in the temple must be constructed only of metal and not of any other material. Now, in Halakha Yudtet, in the 19th Halakha, in this first chapter, Maimonides clarifies this principle even further. Now, we're going to be learning a bit later on that there are details pertaining to every one of the vessels that really must be fulfilled in order for each particular vessel to be considered kosher, meaning to be fulfilling exactly what Hashem had in mind, the requirements of the vessel, and every level of understanding for its functioning in the temple. We're also going to be learning the significance of the various metals that are used in the temple vessels, why the Torah commands that certain vessels be constructed of gold, others of silver, others of copper. But right now, Armonides has laid down for us as a basic principle the idea that indeed the temple vessels must be made out of metal. And here in Halakha Yudtet, number 19, we have the following entry, Hayu hakahal aniyim, osin otan afilu shel bdil, ve'im ha'ashiru osin otan zahav. Maimonides tells us this principle that even regarding certain vessels that must be constructed of gold, about which the Torah tells us quite clearly which material is to be used, which metal, if the congregation at the time were impoverished, if the general stature of the, na of the nation was uh, a lowly state, they were uh, subjugated by, by other powers, they were not able to, uh, to truly fulfill the commandment in its best sense. So the Rambam tells us there is a principle that if the congregation were poor, then they may make these vessels even of tin, which is the lowliest basic metal, and when they become wealthier, then at that time they shall make them of gold. Now interestingly, the very case in point from which our sages derive this principle is from the case of the menorah. And as you will recall, the Torah actually tells us in a verse, you shall make a menorah of pure gold, of one piece shall you make the menorah. Now here we have a verse which tells us quite clearly that the Torah requires the menorah to be one piece of pure gold. And of course there is so many ideas behind this. There are so many spiritual rectifications of why it's necessary for the menorah to be of gold. But yet there is a principle in Jewish law which our sages derive from this very verse which is discussed in the Talmud. And that principle is, yes, the basic requirements as best as possible would be to create the menorah out of gold. However, if it were not possible, then it may be constructed of any metal. And this principle is true, as Maimonides records here, regarding all of the vessels, that they may be even made of the most base metal. Now how do our sages derive this principle from the very verse which indicates quite clearly that the menorah must be made out of one piece of pure gold? And here we have an opportunity to explore uh, a key principle in one of the rules of how the Torah is expounded. And again, this is really the difference between an understanding of um, the research and understanding of how we can delve into the depths of meaning of the verses of the Torah from a traditional point of view of the Torah being revealed at Sinai together with all of the principles that accompany it that we receive from Moses in order to expound upon the Torah in every generation. Again, this is one of the places where we can see the inexorable bond between the written Torah and the oral Torah coming from the same source, same level of authority, and same level of sanctity.
two halves of one whole. The difference between reading a dry text, which any person can interpret on their own and say, well, I think it means this and you think it means that, the difference between that approach and the approach of the Jewish people from time immemorial having a set of standards, a set of principles that was revealed by God at the Sinai Revelation in order for us to understand and to plumb the greatest depths of the Torah. So, the principle that we are actually referring to here, one of the principles of derivation with which our sages of blessed memory are equipped from Sinai, from the authority of Sinai, to um, derive meaning from the verses, it's called Klal Uprat Uklal. It basically means, in a straight translation, a general principle, and then a specific idea, and then again, a general principle. And actually, this verse, Va'asita menorat zahav tohor miksha ta'aseh menorah, you shall make a menorah of pure gold of one piece. This verse is actually expounded by uh, our sages and um, explained according to this particular principle by none other than Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the great Rabbi Judah the Prince called Rebbe or Rabbeinu HaKadosh, our holy master who is actually the editor-in-chief in of the Mishnah. He teaches us that the rule of Torah explanation called Klal, Uprat Uklal, a general principle, a specific, specificity, and another, and another, again, reverting to the general principle, is applied to this verse in the following manner. Vasita menorah, meaning, and you shall create a menorah, is a general principle that the Torah is giving us a commandment. God is telling us you must make a menorah without any preconditions. I obligate you to create a menorah. The next word in the verse is zahav, of gold. And now the Torah specifies, really, and makes it more, um, more particular which material is to be used to create the menorah. So that is the prat. In other words, again, klal. The general principle is you must create a menorah. Prat, what is the specific requirement? It must be made out of gold. And then the verse, again, reverts to klal, to the general idea, miksha ta'asa ha and that is speaking again about the general concept of the menorah, make it of one piece. Now, according to these rules of interpretation, which actually were given to Moses at Mount Sinai, there is an idea that the way this is understood is that the general principle, and here we are taking concepts that have been discussed in the, in the world of Torah study uh, ever since the, the very beginning, ever since Mount Sinai, and these are principles which Torah scholars in every generation use to expound the Torah. The uh, general principle and the specific principle are similar in their content. And basically, what our sages teach from here is that, yes, the Torah's obligation is to create a menorah out of one piece of solid gold. However, the principle of klalu pratu klal in this particular verse teaches us that were you not able, and this is the exposition of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi in this particular passage in the Talmud, if the congregation would not be able to create a menorah out of gold for whatever circumstances that would be preventing it, then they would still be obligated to create a menorah out of any other metal. However, because of the, of the complicated process in which this procedure of understanding works and in which these rules are derived, the details pertaining to the menorah, meaning that it must be, as the verse indicates, 18 handbreadths high, that it must contain a certain number, actually 42, of the embellishments, the decorations of the menorah, the flowers, cups, and knobs, as we're going to learn, and that it must be made out of one piece. All of these conditions only apply to a menorah made out of gold. However, were it to be necessary, even temporarily, to create a menorah out of any other metal, then that menorah would be kosher for use, as long as it's made out of metal, but it would not have to have 
neither would it have to be made out of one piece. It would not have to have the 42 flowers, cups, and knobs. And this is in the case where it would not be made out of gold. It also would not have to be 18 hand breaths. So now what we're saying is that there is the general command of the Torah, which is to make the menorah out of one piece of solid gold. However, in the backdrop of this is, is the understanding of our sages that God foresaw the possibility that it may not be possible at one particular period to construct a menorah out of gold, in which case, temporarily, the menorah could be kindled, a menorah out of any other material, in which case it would not have to have these uh, aspects that we mentioned. Now, all of this actually has a historical precedence. Again, Maimonides here taught us, if the congregation was wealthy, uh, excuse me, if the congregation was impoverished, then they would make the sacred vessels out of any metal, even out of tin. And once they become able to afford it, then they would make them out of gold. The principle here that's particularly fascinating is that this is exactly the manner in which the Chashmonayim, the Maccabees of Hanukkah fame, actually reinstated the divine service of the menorah in the temple. We recall that the Chashmonayim were victorious over the Greek invaders and they rededicated the temple at the time of Hanukkah and it was necessary for them to create a new menorah because the temple menorah had been defiled and in fact destroyed by the invaders. And according to the Talmud, actually they took simple rods made out of lead and they forged them into a primitive type of menorah. And in fact there are some opinions that they actually took their swords that they had used in victory over the invaders. And this in itself is quite amazing because it involves other halachic questions of whether or not that would have been possible because weren't, weren't the swords exposed to death. And there's a great deal of commentary around that fascinating issue. But in any event, as the Talmud tells us, they took simple lead rods and they forged them into a shape where they would be able to kindle eight lights uh, excuse me, the seven, the seven lights of the menorah, the original menorah. Later on in history, when they regained some of their wealth, they were able to make that into silver. And only much, much later, a number of years later, over 20 years later, were they able to again create a menorah of gold. So this in itself is the fulfillment of this very concept that our sages derive from this very verse and actually meets exactly with what the Rambam is teaching us here as a historical precedent. So they first created a menorah which was very, very simple and modest, and later they redid the menorah of gold. And Maimonides continues and tells us, Afilo ha-mizrakot v'ha-shipudim v'ha-magrefot shel mizbach ha-ola v'ha-midot im yesh koach b'tzibur Maimonides tells us that even the smaller details, the vessels used to gather the blood of the offerings, the various shovels and parts uh, that are used for the uh, altar of the offerings and the measuring units, all of these smaller vessels, were the congregation to be able to afford it, then they should make them out of gold. Because there's a general principle here that wherever possible to add honor to the Holy Temple and to bestow upon it a certain splendor is actually a mitzvah to do so wherever possible. Maimonides tells us, Afidu sha'arei ha'azara mechafinotan zahav im matza yadam. Even the very gates of the, of the court, the very gates leading up to the sanctuary, were the congregation to be able to afford it, these gates should be overlaid with gold. So actually, this is all according to historic precedent, just as we have learned regarding the menorah, that the original uh, menorah that was recreated by the Chashmonayim was made of a 
of a much cheaper metal. And only afterwards was it overlain, and only afterwards was it made out of silver, and only much later were they able to make one out of gold. So too there is actually another historical precedent which follows according to the dictates of Maimonides here. And that is when we recall, as the Talmud tells us, that when the returning uh, exiles came back to Israel from the Babylonian exile, when they first began to reestablish the second temple, as we read about, for example, in the book of Ezra, <clears throat> and when the divine service was first reinstated, those beginnings, those days of the second temple were indeed extremely humble. And in fact, the temple really still lay in ruins. Work was being done on it even as the service of the altar was reinstated. And there are those moving verses in the book of Ezra that tells us, tell us about the, the different sounds, the wailing of the older people who remembered the splendor of the first temple mixing with the shouts of joy of the younger people who never saw the first temple but were so thrilled that any temple service at all was being reinstated. In that period, the early days of the beginning of the second temple, those early exiles who returned, those were indeed very humble origins. And we know that much later in history, under the reign of King Herod, the second temple reached such a level of splendor that, as we have learned, the Mishnah tells us that whoever never saw the second temple, the building of Herod, has indeed never seen a beautiful building. And those were the days when every aspect of the temple bespoke glory and grandeur, and everything was done in such a way as to beautify and honor and extol the commandment of building a house for the Divine Presence as best as possible. But even so, in those earlier days, the days of the the very humble beginning of the Second Temple, everything was as it should be. It was all provided for by the structure of Jewish law as revealed by God to Moses at Mount Sinai and as Maimonides here records for us that wherever possible, yes, things should be done on a more grand level as best as possible to reflect honor for the God of Israel. But in the meantime, anything that can be done even of the most base and cheap type of metal is also going to be considered to be kosher for use. There is another uh, period of time which the Talmud refers to when the king uh, from the mountains of Armenia called Munbaz, who was actually the son of Queen Helena, whom the Talmud tells us about, um, he made many donations to beautify the temple and actually saw to it that even the handles of the vessels, the various vessels that were used to gather the blood of the sacrifices uh, on Yom Kippur, that even the very handles of these vessels were made out of gold. So this particular halacha, halacha number 19, and everything that Maimonides tells us is actually a reflection we've seen fulfilled in specific historical periods that our sages record for us. So we see that indeed the Jewish people at any particular point in time continue with their goal of serving God as best as possible in as beautiful a manner as possible. However, provisions are made in, for this to be done according to the particular circumstances and situation that they may in fact find themselves in at any given time. And now we come to the last halacha of this chapter. Our first chapter, chapter Aleph in Hilchot Beit HaBechira, the laws of the chosen house the concluding halacha of this chapter. Maimonides tells us, Ein osin kol hakelim mitchilatan ela l'shem hakodesh. Important principle that all of the vessels, the sacred vessels that are used in the Holy Temple, from their very inception, from the time that they are being created, they must be created with a thought in mind that they're going to be used for the holy purpose of the service in the Holy Temple. In other words, if every other requirement regarding these vessels was fulfilled, regarding their weight, their shape, their material, but yet they were not made with the proper intention, then they would be invalid for use in the divine service. So this is the, the important contribution of the craftsman that he must know at the time that he is making them that they are going to be used for a holy purpose. Otherwise, they will be rendered invalid.
For as Maimonides continues, he tells us, For if from their very inception, from the beginning, they were made for a mundane purpose, they cannot be reinstated, they cannot be upgraded, as it were. They cannot be changed to use for a higher purpose. So this is actually an insight into a very specific and interesting condition which tells us something about the very nature of these vessels and how they differ from mundane and ordinary vessels. And that is because their singularity, the singularity of these vessels is not only based upon the fashion in which they are used, but even the fashion in which they are created. Because if they don't have the proper kavana, if they weren't made with the proper intention from the very beginning, they cannot be changed. They must remain vessels that are used for a lower purpose. However, and here it actually gets very interesting, Maimonides continues and tells us, However, one of these vessels, which was indeed created with the proper intention and was made for the divine service in mind, until it's actually used one time for a holy aspect of the divine service, they could actually be used for something ordinary. In other words, this is amazing. If they are not made with the proper intention, then they can never be used for the divine service. However, even if they were created with the proper kavanot, they were made with the intention from the very beginning that they were going to be used for the divine service in the holy temple. They can still be used for some other purpose until the first time that they are actually used for something sacred. The Rambam tells us, but from the time that they actually were used one time for a holy purpose, Asurin lehediot. Then they do become, in fact, forbidden for mundane use. So this is a halacha which actually classifies uh, for us the different levels of sanctity in how these vessels are actually used. Because a vessel which is actually categorized as having been created as a sacred vessel from the very beginning until the time that it's actually used and inaugurated, as it were, for sacred use by the first usage, then it may still be used for another purpose. However, conversely, if the vessel was never intended to use for anything sacred, then indeed it may never be changed. And Maimonides concludes and tells us, Avanim v'korot, Stones and beams which were hewn from start, from scratch, from the very beginning for a synagogue, these materials may not be used for construction on the Temple Mount. And this is quite interesting because we can infer from the words of Maimonides that even when it comes to something holy, there's a synagogue, is also something holy, a place where we pray to Hashem, a place where the Torah is kept, a place where the Torah is studied. But even in the realm of sanctity, there are levels. And apparently, our sages comment, what Maimonides seems to be telling us is that there are levels of sanctity which would actually imply that compared to the Temple Mount, a synagogue's level of sanctity is like mundane. So that if materials were fashioned, were hewn, were cut from the very beginning for use for a synagogue, it would be impossible to uplift, to upgrade those materials to use for a part on the Temple Mount because the level of sanctity of the Temple Mount is so much higher and we didn't have the proper intention when those things were being prepared because we felt that they were going to be used for a synagogue, even though a synagogue is holy, but it's not the same level of sanctity of anything pertaining to the Temple Mount.
So we have now concluded the first chapter of the Rambam, Maimonides, Hilchot, Beta Bechira, the laws of the chosen house. And we recall we have actually learned a great deal in this chapter about the basic structure, the outline, the components necessary to be included in the Holy Temple from the very beginning of the introduction of the idea of the Holy Temple to the Jewish people, those things that were included in the Temple Scroll. We have learned a little bit about some of the major vessels. We have learned a little bit about the altar and some of the details pertaining to the Temple. In the next chapter of the Rambam, Hilchot Beit HaBechira, we're going to be delving to the length and breadth and width of the concept of the altar, everything pertaining to the altar, how it is to be created, its dimensions, its spiritual significance as well, as we continue on our study of Maimonides and we see that these laws that he has preserved for us and recorded and is giving over are structured and complete and detailed, all for the purpose of seeing us through to the day when we will be able to actualize them to rebuild the temple, that is our destiny, and we are promised that the light of the Divine Presence will indeed return to the world and shine forth from the temple, the light to Israel, and the light to the nations.